people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. Hello viewers, I'm your host Uzma Jafri with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. Foreign ministers of Shanghai Cooperation Organization, a regional security grouping met in India, state of Goa, to discuss the regional security matters. In a veiled attack, Indian Foreign Minister Subramaniam Jayashankar also called out Pakistan for its consistent support to terrorism. Foreign ministers of the Shanghai Corporation Organization gathered in India's Goa state this week to discuss regional security matters. Indian Foreign Minister Subramaniam Jay Shankar welcomed, among others, his Pakistani counterpart Bilawal Bhutto Zardari, who was the first senior Pakistani leader to visit India in nine years amid long standing tensions between the large nuclear armed South Asian rivals. Dr. Jay Shankar took a scathing swipe on Pakistan for its role in spreading terrorism on Indian soil. While the world was engaged in facing COVID and its consequences, the menace of terrorism continues unabated. Taking our eyes off this menace would be detrimental to our security interests. We firmly believe that there can be no justification for terrorism and it must be stopped in all its forms and manifestations, including cross-border terrorism. The SEO, or Political and Security Union of Countries, spanning much of Eurasia, was formed in 2001 by Russia, China and ex-Soviet states in Central Asia and the body has been expanded to include India and Pakistan. The summit that came in the backdrop of protracted Russia-Ukraine war also prepared ground for an SEO summit in India in July that Russian President Vladimir Putin and Chinese counterpart Xi Jinping are expected to attend in person. The world is today facing a multitude of challenges. These events have disrupted global supply chains, leading to serious impact on the supply of energy, food and fertilizers, and cascading effects on developing nations. Pakistan, India's arch rival, is also a member of SEO. Its foreign minister, Bilawal Bhutto Zardari, is making its first visit by a high ranking Pakistani official to India in nearly a decade. Zardari's attendance triggered speculation of a thaw in strained relations between the two South Asian countries. India has maintained that SEO forum should be used to address concerns of all sorts, whether be it political, economic or the most important one, the security issues. These challenges, however, are also an opportunity for member states of the SEO to collaborate and address them collectively. Russia and China founded the SEO in 2001 as a counterweight to United States alliances across East Asia to the Indian Ocean. The group includes the four Central Asian nations of Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan and Uzbekistan, which Russia considers its backyard. In 2017, India and Pakistan became members and Iran is set to join later this year. Moving on, the United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres has once again expressed concerns over the prevailing situation in the war torn Afghanistan. The Taliban ruled Afghanistan has faced global criticism and a sort of ostracization for its repressive and exclusive rule, wherein it barred the girls and women from higher education and banned them from a large number of professions. Persisting problems have further been exacerbated by terrorism that is once again rearing its head from the country's rugged mountains. The international community has time and again called out for a peaceful resolution of Afghan problems, but nothing has happened apparently worked till now.
UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres recently said that the international community was worried about the stability in Afghanistan. While the global community had flagged concerns about the women rights, financial situation and drug trafficking in the country, a sudden spike in the number of terrorist attacks has added to their worries. Guterres said the situation in Afghanistan was the largest humanitarian crisis in the world today and that he would meet the Taliban when it was the right moment to do so. The participants are worried about the stability of Afghanistan and have expressed those serious concerns. They relate to the persistent presence of terrorist organizations, a risk for the country, the region, and further afield. The lack of inclusivity, which importantly includes human rights, in particular those of women and girls, severely undermined by recent Taliban decisions. And the spread of drug trafficking with all its dramatic consequences. The Taliban returned to power in August 2021 and have restricted Afghan women and girls from participating in the most areas of public and daily life. Women nationals have also been barred from working with the UN in a country where nearly 29 million people depend on humanitarian assistance. The UN Security Council recently unanimously adopted a resolution condemning the decision, saying that it undermines human rights and humanitarian principles. The international community have repeatedly urged the Taliban to lift the ban and allow women to lead a dignified life at par with the men, but the group, which previously promised liberal approach towards women, has taken a U-turn and has barred women from the mainstream. The current ban on Afghan women working for the United Nations and national and international NGOs is unacceptable and puts lives in jeopardy. Afghanistan is facing isolation and suspension of humanitarian operations over restrictions on women, but Taliban have already made it clear that they are not going to change. Despite repeated multilateral and bilateral discussions, Little progress has been made on Afghan issues since the Taliban takeover. Over 180 international organizations suspended operations during the crucial winter months last year as a result of the ban on female NGO workers. And while people continue to wait for a better future, observers predict 2023 too will be a year of disappointment and sadness. The future, they say, is immensely bleak for Afghans. In the dark intervening night of 27th and 28th April, brave Indian Air Force pilots flew blind in the face of overwhelming odds to rescue 121 stranded Indians in the water on Sudan. In an exquisite display of unwavering valor and impeccable operational astuteness, Indian Bravehearts, with no navigational approach aids or fuel, landed on a rundown airstrip at Wadi Sayyidina with the help of infrared sensors and night vision goggles. In a narrow time frame, with the engine still running, the commandos on board secured passengers and their luggage and accomplished what seemed like an unattainable task in a span of a few minutes. This wasn't an isolated incident when Indians went above and beyond the call of duty to protect its citizens in need. India has ensured a collective will to work to keep Indian citizens safe, both home and abroad. Join us as we take a deeper look at India's successful evacuation missions and the policies and people behind them. Even if you are stuck on the Mars, Indian Embassy there will help you. This tweet from India's late former external affairs minister, Sushma Swaraj in 2017, was not merely a reassuring response to a purported distress call, but a display of India's resolve to protect her citizens, no matter which corner of the world they were in. India's actions have been consistent with her statements. India undertook a daring and massive endeavor Operation Kaveri to safely bring back some 3,000 stranded Indians from the conflict-ridden northeastern African country of Sudan. It was not an easy job because 
Khartoum is much inside uh, and uh, from there and we, I think around Khartoum, in Khartoum there was a lot of violence going on. Mm. Uh, so to rescue Indian community from Khartoum was a problem. Also there were people spread around in the country, in the country Sudan. So to bring them uh, to Port Sudan from where they could be shifted to Jeddah uh, for eventual evacuation to India. All that was really very tough. Uh, but I must say that I think Indian government has been now uh, uh, of late in many such situations uh, acting with great uh, speed and uh, coordination and uh, doing excellent job. The mission was fraught with logistical challenges, potential acts of aggression, and political and communication barriers. But the resolute emergency response teams under committed leadership in New Delhi navigated through all hurdles and successfully brought their brethren back home. Time and time again, be it safely evacuating Indian students in Ukraine during the Russia-Ukraine war, providing an immediate way out for Indians in China and other countries during the COVID-induced global lockdowns, or going as far as Yemen or terrorist-held territories in Iraq to evacuate her people. India has demonstrated both her commitment towards her citizens and her capacity to confront a crisis and emerge successful. In 2015, India's Operation Raha, a massive two-pronged large-scale rescue mission, saved over 6,710 individuals, including over 1,962 foreign nationals from the war-torn Yemen. When the deadly COVID pandemic struck the world and forced people into lockdown, the Modi government's Operation Vande Bharat brought back over 6 million Indians from across the globe. Hundreds of others were safely evacuated under Operation Ganga as India sprang into action as soon as the Russia-Ukraine conflict intensified. Operation Sukun, Operation Safe Homecoming, Operation Metri, the list goes on. India, which has become even more proactive in the last few years, has always been one of the first responders to reach out to her citizens. India spares no effort as far as shielding her people from harm's way goes. From military and civil aircrafts to ships and road transportation, India mobilizes every resource at its disposal for the protection of her citizens. At the heart of these successful operations, Indian leadership has demonstrated equal levels of assertiveness and responsiveness in rescuing individuals. It was the result of tireless Indian efforts that Indian National Hamid Ansari, who was falsely accused and sentenced to prison by a Pakistani court, was released. Despite diplomatic challenges with India's arch-rival Pakistan, India secured her citizens' release. A law-abiding country, India has approached the International Court of Justice and sought justice for another Indian national, Kulbushan Jadav, who was falsely accused of espionage and sentenced to death by a Pakistani court. India always upholds the law while also ensuring that she utilizes all the available options in the book to ensure that her citizens are never treated unfairly and are never subjected to inconvenience or injustice overseas. While India has used dialogue and diplomacy to secure the releases of individuals who inadvertently entered other countries' territories, like with the many cases in China and Sri Lanka, she has also been assertive and forceful when the usual tactics do not work. One such example was when the Indian Air Force's then wing commander, Abhinandan Vartaman, was held captive by Pakistani forces. Although the details of the diplomatic talks are not available in the public domain, Pakistani leadership, which initially misled Indians about the officer's whereabouts, later acknowledged his presence on their soil and also released him with the status of a prisoner of war. The Pakistani government realized that India is serious, that it will escalate further, so which would have, they would have lost much more in the bargain and therefore 
they returned Abhinandan in the shortest possible time. Such incidents showcase India's unwavering commitment to the safety and well-being of her citizens. Even in the most challenging circumstances, India has protected her people. The government says it is committed to providing all forms of assistance to every Indian, whether he is one of the 1.4 billion people residing within the country, or one of the over 32 million overseas Indians living in different parts of the world. Apart from emergency assistance, India also provides her overseas citizens with legal assistance, consular services, and even financial assistance. People wherever they are, like even in ordinary circumstances, if an Indian is arrested, let us say, or gets stuck in some country or something like that, our embassy uh, seeks consular access, goes and our officers go and meet them wherever they are. Uh, they try to provide them legal assistance or any of the social, uh, if they need some food, any, any kind of assistance they need. So this is an ongoing process on a virtually daily basis. Thanks to India's growing diplomatic prowess, Indians are respected globally. The Indian diaspora is a force to be reckoned with and is reaping the benefits of India's growing economic and diplomatic strength. Meanwhile, New Delhi's commitment to her people remains unwavering and goes far beyond India's territorial boundaries. Time now for Asia This Week, the stories from across the continent. Israelis launched a nationwide protest day of equality to demonstrate against the government's planned judicial overhaul and other policies. In Tel Aviv, Israel's financial and commercial center, protesters of the high-tech industry toppled a huge installation of domino to warn against what they described as a financial domino effect. This domino bricks represents what will happen. The high-tech will move out because there is no uh, democracy ecosystem for the high-tech. And then, the same like the bricks here, things will start to fall. Other protesters, including headmates, dressed in red cloaks and white bonnets, staged a protest in front of Tel Aviv's rabbinical courts to demonstrate against what they say are discriminating government policies. Later, protesters ran onto Ayalon Highway, one of the country's busiest roads, stopped cars and blocked traffic. Police later moved them back off the highway. Tel Aviv's highway blockade came after a morning full of various small protests as Israelis opposing the government's planned judicial overhaul have been posing protests for over three months. Shell Public Limited Company this week launched its first electricity ferry globally at its Singapore refinery and said it would work with the city-state port authority to cut emissions from ships. The move is a step towards meeting the Singapore Port Authority's rule that all new harbour craft operating in its waters should be electric or run on biofuels or net zero fuels from 2030. Shell Eastern Trading has agreed to work with the Port Authority to develop charging infrastructure for electric harbour craft and conduct research and development for low and zero carbon fuels over five years. The oil giant launched the first of a series of 200-seater electric commuter ferries at its refinery petrochemical complex on Palau Bukom. The first electric ferry Penguin Refresh is scheduled to start operating in May and another two will be put on by August, partly replacing diesel-powered ferries now in use. With the three new ferries, Shell will save about 1,952 tons a year of diesel and will reduce carbon dioxide emissions by about 6,258 tons a year. Power for the ferries will still be generated by a fossil fuel, natural gas. The company also plans to run a hydrogen fuel cell trial on a Shell chartered vessel later this year.
NASA astronaut Steve Bowen and UAE astronaut Sultan Al Nayadi ventured outside the International Space Station for a six and a half hour spacewalk last Friday to make preparations for the installation of the station's power generation system. The astronauts exited the station's Quest airlock to prepare for future installation of upgraded solar arrays on the starboard side of the station's truss. Bowen and Al Nayadi were set to retrieve S band antenna equipment and take it inside the space station for refurbishment. The spacewalk is part of a series to augment the station's power channels with new International Space Station rollout solar arrays. Four of the new arrays have been installed so far, and two additional arrays will be mounted on the install platforms during the future spacewalks following their arrival this year on SpaceX's 28th Commercial V Supply Services mission for NASA. U.S. Spacewalk 86 is the eighth spacewalk for Bowen and the first for any UAE astronaut, NASA reported on their website. People thronged the streets of Madurai in India's southern state of Tamil Nadu to witness the union of Lord Sundareswarar in the form of Lord Shiva and Goddess Minakshi. Shiva devotees celebrated this union with great pomp in the form of Chitharai festival. This festival is a confluence of religion, art, entertainment and food. A large number of devotees gathered at the Minakshi Sundareshwar temple in India's southern city Madurai to participate in a flag hoisting ceremony and mark the beginning of the Chitharai festival. The temple city wore a festive look as devotees from across India and abroad flocked to Madurai to witness the grand spectacle. Ahead of the flag hoisting, priests performed special rituals and chanted hymns during the ceremony. Minakshi Temple is one of the largest of its kind. This temple is dedicated to the goddess Minakshi Devi and Lord Shiva. Niki Kodiatrum, Minakshi Tirikalyanataka and a Kodiatra, Kata Larna, and another trick, Vegu Merchania, and the Tirikalyanataka and a Modernal Niki Kodiatrum Rade, other Nangapaka, Katala, or Elmonicula on the top, Panda in the Yella Kodi Janangal Kodirka, and the Sandosha, Engelke, Enga Viticaliano, Abdindra or Trip Dile, Nangella Rume, and the Kodiata Path Rumba. அதாவது உலக மக்கள் எல்லாரும் குரு பேர்ச்சி இன்னைக்கு எல்லாருக்கும் சகல ஐஸ்வர்யமும் கிடைக்கணும் மீனாட்சி திருவருளால எல்லாரும் நல்லா இருக்கணும் நான் பரிபூர்ணமா வேண்டிக்கிறேன் devotees carried out a procession during the procession artists and devotees perform folk dances which enthrall the crowd preparations for this festival started long back Sculptures were beautifully painted and the temple was decorated with flowers and petals. One of the events is Patta Bisekam, in which Goddess Minakshi Devi is crowned as the Queen of Madurai. This is followed by the Dik Vijayam event, which represents the time when Goddess Minakshi Amma went to the battle where she fell in love with Lord Shiva. In subsequent events, it's shown that Lord Shiva marries Goddess Minakshi. Goddess has welcomed millions of pilgrims to her shrine through the centuries. There are many Hindu festivals that celebrate Lord Vishnu and Indian goddesses and their different manifestations. With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care. Subscribe Tag TV YouTube channel and press the notification button.